Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Miriam Klein, and we'll discuss the Premonstra Tensions, also known as the Norbertines, the order that makes up St. Norbert College. Dr. Klein, an Irish scholar and archaeologist, recently spoke at St. Norbert about the Premonstra Tensions in medieval Ireland. The Norbertines established eight monasteries and two hospitals in Ireland in the late 12th and 13th centuries. Miriam, welcome to St. Norbert College. Thank you very much for having me. Well, as we can tell from, uh, from the way you speak, you're from Ireland, is that correct? That is correct. And whereabouts uh, did you grow up in Ireland? I grew up right in the middle of Ireland, uh, almost in the very centre, in a very small town called Abbey Leaks. Um, I don't think the fact that the, the word Abbey is included has anything to do with my uh, future career. But, uh, there, there is an Abbey in... Uh, Abbey Leaks. Is an Ab Abbey Leaks. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, uh, what interested you in archaeology if it wasn't the Abbey there? How did, when did you first realize that you wanted to be an archaeologist? Well, before that, when I think back on it, uh, my dad was a civil engineer and uh, we, he was really interested in, uh, I suppose, archaeology. But I didn't realize it as such. And from when I was very, very small, he would take me um, out to look at sites. I think maybe I was the only one out of six in the family who would actually go with them. I don't know that. But uh, so that was, I suppose, really the start. The interest was there. And then I remember just quite just thinking back on it again, that I was just standing on the side of a road one day in the countryside, near, not too far from where I lived, and there was the ruin of a house. And I was maybe about seven, eight years of age, and I thought, who lived in this? Why did it fall down? You know, and since then, every time I pass that piece of road, the house is now gone. I just always look and think, that's where the house was. Well, you know, here, here in the U.S., we think of old as being 200 years old. But we're, we're here in Green Bay, we're very impressed with ourselves because we have uh, uh, a history that goes way back, even before the European settlers, uh, maybe maybe a thousand years. And the Europeans have been here for mm, close to 400 years or so. Um, in Ireland, it's a little bit longer than that, isn't that true? I think so, yes. <laughs> um, so what is graduate school like for an archaeologist? Do you immediately get to go out on digs? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. First of all, you do the theory. You have to learn uh, all about the prehistory and then archaeology in the historic period. And generally in Ireland, um, it finishes around at the end of the medieval period for archaeology. Uh, there are one or two universities that go beyond that, and some do even industrial archaeology. So first of all, you do the um, theory, the books, you learn about it, and you're encouraged to go out uh, on what they call field trips to look at real sites as opposed to photographs. Uh, most students would do that, and that's all part of college life. <clears throat> and sometimes you go away for a weekend you know, with your, um, rest, the other students and see a great number of sites. You're then encouraged to go on excavations or to take part in survey work recording sites. And it's really from, I think, those that are truly interested in following this on as a career who do that sort of thing. You will get some others as well. It's, it's a nice way to pass the summer holidays and um, so there, uh, so then you do your final exams, and also you take you kind of uh, graduate in more than one subject. So then you make a choice, which you would like to be. Well, I think that most Americans, when they think of archaeology, uh, they probably think of the the golden era of uh, Egyptology, which uh, was. I mean, at first, I think it was mostly. Um, uh, amateurs that were there and uh, that some of them did a tremendous amount of damage trying to extract uh, 
extract uh, things. Um, but in the last hundred or so years, the, the profession has really uh, figured that out. And it's become, from what I can tell, I'm an economist, so yeah. I'm not sure, but a lot of, uh, of brushwork, a lot of cleaning work, et cetera, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's almost like being a jeweler. Yes, I think the reason as a background as to why it's not just amateurs anymore um, is because governments have now are now regulating who gets a license or who can be allowed uh, to uh, direct excavations and they must be done to certain standards. Um, certainly in Europe that is the way uh, most countries would approach it. Do you remember your first exciting find. The first time when you found something that you realized that, wow, this is new, no one else knows about this. Do you remember what that was yeah, and where I, it was? My very first real excavation was one I um, studied at um, firstly in University College Dublin, did undergraduate, and then I did a master's at uh, what's now the National University of Ireland, Galway. and. Um, so from there, one of the uh, lecturers, later Professor John Waddell, he uh, had an excavation up in a place north of us uh, called Rathcrohan. And Rathcrohan really was the royal site of the western province of Ireland, which is called Connacht. And the O'Connor kingship uh, came from there, both in prehistory and in just the, the period just after that, which is the early medieval times, or the early Middle Ages. And we were excavating a monument called Dahi's Mount, and it should have been uh, prehistoric, totally, but um, there were absolutely no finds at all. And we were going up and down this mound, just, you know, troweling down, down. Then you start at the top, and then bingo, just turn back the soil, and there was a very nice uh, pin, early medieval. So that was the first real find. The other real finds that, um, and it was a really exciting site, that is quite a famous site, a site is, is the site at um, Wood Quay in Dublin. And I worked on that with uh, Dr. Pat Wallace, who's just recently retired from the National Museum as director. And uh, we were spoiled. Every piece of soil you turned, there was finds in it and structures. And of course, it was a totally wooden world in, um, this is Viking Dublin now. It's, um, so you're talking, we were excavating around the time when I was there, the house, I remember Pat Wallace saying, these people fought in the Battle of Clontarf, which was the big battle in 1014 between the king, Brian Baru, he was of Munster, the southern province, and the Viking settlers of Dublin. And uh, so that puts us into a nice time frame. But um, that was a, an absolutely wonderful site, a very controversial site. Um, because people felt at the time, around the late 70s, 80s, that sort of time, uh, that um, the site should be preserved. But of course it was totally wooden world, which it, and uh, it was preserved because of the uh, waterlogged conditions. So of course when you take the material out of water, it disintegrates, but there was everything from leather to you know, metalwork which would survive without the water. Uh, you had beautiful silks from the Orient. You had, mm. there was an awful lot of amber um, that came with the Vikings uh, from the Baltic areas. And um, it, we were just spoiled for, for finds. It was so exciting <laughs> to have all this material coming up. And the contrast then was the site of Rathcrohan, no finds. And then one is so exciting. Well, I, I know how I feel when I find my reading glasses in the kitchen. So I, I, maybe just a <laughs> tiny little <laughs> portion of that. Well, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Norbertines and when they came yeah. to Ireland. But if we can put that into context a little bit and talk about when, you know, the earliest peoples of Ireland um, and uh, maybe a little bit how the Irish became uh, Catholic. Um, well, the earliest people are what are called... Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, you're talking, and then you have 
what it um what is called the, the um Neolithic or the New Stone Age. The Mesolithic is the Middle Stone Age. We don't have the what we call the Paleolithic uh, at all in Ireland. We haven't found them as yet. Um, that's where people lived in caves. But we have the middle middle group who uh, were hunter gatherers, and then we have the Stone Age or uh, the Late Stone Age, if you like, the New Neolithic. Um, that's when people initially were not farmers and then they took up farming and they built these enormous, very sometimes enormous, megalithic tombs or great stone tombs. And the Irish uh, are quite famous for their megalithic tombs. Uh, there were burial monuments. And then after the New Stone Age or the Neolithic, you have the Bronze Age. And uh, the Bronze Age was when uh, metalwork really started, as the name of it suggests. Firstly with bronze, and at the end of the Bronze Age you have uh, a lot of gold work and very fine, be beautiful pieces of n like neck ornaments, bracelets, earrings in gold. So Ireland had a lot of gold at the end of the Bronze Age. Then you have what's called the Iron Age, because iron came in and that's a bit of a dark age at the moment. There's some research being done to try and get more of an idea of what went on at that time. Very few monuments but they're coming more to the fore. That is really at the time when the Romans were in power so it puts it into perspective around the time of Christ. And then you have Christianity coming into Ireland. Ireland was Christianized in the 5th century. Uh, first of all, by Palladius, who was sent by the Pope to uh, be the bishop for the Irish believing in Christ, which suggests that there were some Christianization before that. And he came in 431, and then the following year, 432, uh, Patrick came as bishop. And of course, the story of St. Patrick, who is the patron saint of Ireland, and is credited with uh, Christianizing Ireland. Uh, his story has, of course, overshadowed the earlier people, missionaries who came. And then after, then you have uh, the development of monasticism in Ireland when the um, Irish became quite famous throughout, well, especially Western and Central Europe. And their uh, monks went and founded such famous places as St. Gaul in Switzerland, you have Bobbio in Italy, or ex examples. They traveled the continent because they had something to offer, setting up uh, man manuscripts. Uh, they brought manuscripts with them, and we have a number of these. And then coming towards the end of that time, you have the Vikings fitting in. You're talking about um, 7th, 8th, ninth century on that time. And of course, they were really sea people who made settlements on the coast, Dublin being a big one, uh, and down around the south coast of Ireland and just slightly up the west coast as well, mainly. And then after that, you have um, coming in the 12th century, you have the beginning of English settlement in Ireland with the what are called the Anglo Normans or the English Normans because they came originally from Normandy with the Battle of Hastings and settled in England uh, in 1066. And then a century later, they were invited over to Ireland as, you know, to help the King of Leinster, Diarmuid MacMorrow. But um, there always has been a lot of contact between Ireland and, of course, England and Britain, and also continental Europe, even though we're right out on the periphery. Um, the sea, it was easier to travel by sea than overland, and much quicker, of course. And uh, then with the start of the English conquest, that was uh, 1166 is the date, the starting date. But by the 14th century, uh, the Gaelic people had taken back over, uh, had become much stronger. So um, it wasn't really until the Tudor, um, times, which you're talking around late 16, 1600, around that time with uh, Henry 
VIII and Queen Elizabeth I, that especially Queen Elizabeth I and into the 17th century onwards that the English really became rooted in Ireland for a while. Uh, but you always had, uh, well, up until that time, you had much of Ireland which had remained very Gaelic. So uh, it was quite a much older culture had survived there and they had their own laws and their own culture and their own way of living. So there were really two Irelands for a while. There was the, the Norman, uh, uh, I don't know how you call it, settlements, I guess, around Dublin and, and the south and up yes. the west coast. Yeah. But most of the center of the country remained very Gaelic, is that correct? Uh, well, it was a partial conquest of Ireland. Good deal of the west part stayed Gaelic, particularly good deal of the north stayed Gaelic as well. And uh, the Midlands, the centre, a lot of that became English, if you like, or Anglo-Norman, and the south. That's, it generalised. There were pockets, of course. Did they get along very well? Were they fighting, or did they reach some sort of agreement, I guess? Well, I think the Irish were quite Europeanised, really, the Gaelic people, more so than we've given them credit for before. So they, they borrowed from each other. And eventually the English, if you like, were in the 14th century, were to a large extent assimilated into the Gaelic culture. Hmm. They dressed like them. Um, and they had the same customs and most of them spoke Irish instead of Eng instead of English was only coming on the scene at that stage because the Normans, the Anglo-Normans when they came of course they spoke French and um, which is the same in England, they spoke French. English only came to be spoken widespread in the 14th century. So then, uh, then it wasn't until later on, until about 1600, that there was a kind of concerted policy to take over all of Ireland by the English, really, at that point. Yeah, I understand yeah. that quite a few uh, surnames that we identify as being Irish actually are Norman. Fitzgerald is one, yes. Burke is, an, is another. Yeah, of course. And, and here we are many, many centuries later, and, uh, and uh, those effects live on. Yes, and the extraordinary thing, both with the Gaelic uh, people and with, if you like, the Anglo-Norman as such uh, territories, is that the same surnames are quite frequently still in those areas. With you know, the generations have come right down. Um, so, like what was the medieval times. Uh, those families owned the lands that was their place and yet still today you have those surnames, you know, people living there in that particular area. Yeah. Well, you're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us is Irish scholar Miriam Klein. Uh, Miriam, let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your particular area of expertise, which is the, the Norbertines in, in Ireland. Um, tell us a little bit about how the Norbertines ended up in Ireland, and what happened to them? Why are they important? Um, to get back to the English, or the Anglo-Normans, and before that, in the uh, 12th century, you have the beginning of what we call reformed religious orders coming into Ireland. These are the uh, Cistercians in particular, the Benedictines just before them first, and then you have other orders, the Augustinians, which mainly there were some, came, some of the communities came from outside, but a lot of them, the, ori the original monasteries in Ireland just converted because they, could, they were engaged in pastoral care. So then towards the end of the 12th century, after the Anglo-Normans uh, started to settle, they brought in some more uh, new orders, religious orders into Ireland, and such as uh, the um, Fratres Cru Cruciferi and the Hospitallers, and and one and another one was the Premonstratensians. So, the orders that came at the end of the 12th century, if you like, they all remained small orders in Ireland, uh, because in the early 13th century. There was the uh, beginnings of the mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans in particular, and they were largely concerned with urban areas because you, uh, in the 12th and 13th century, over much of Europe, um, 
people were starting to live in villages and towns more so than they had been. So there was a need for uh, the mendicants to uh, live in the, in the towns and that. So the orders that had come in, like the pre monstratensians into Ireland at the end of the 12th century, uh, just a few years before the mendicants set foot in Ireland, they remain small orders, a uh, small number of houses and settlements because uh, the patronage, once the mendicants came in, went directly to the mendicants more so. So that is why the, say, Cistercians and the Premonstratensians or Norbertines, they were always called Premonstratensians in the Middle Ages, or sometimes white canons because they wore a white habit. And they still do. They, well, they, <laughs> and they still do indeed, yes. And uh, the Cistercians and the pre monstratensians they were the most popular in the 12th century, right across Christendom, or Western Christendom, because, of course, you had the Eastern Church as well. And um, they just expanded outwards from uh, uh, pre montre for the pre monstratensians which is in northeastern France, and also from Magdeburg in Germany, where St. Uh, Norbert had been archbishop. So you have them going out eastwards from Germany and also from Premontre eastwards, but to the west, uh, to, if you like, Britain and Ireland, they came from Premontre. So they, they were very important. They were important. Um, the Premonstratensians were particularly important because uh, they were canons, so they could minister pa pastoral care in parishes to people, whereas the Cistercians were monks and the Benedictines were monks and they weren't supposed to do it anyway. And uh, so at the same time you have the uh, church from Rome, the Latin church as it was called, uh, was being reformed and you had uh, parishes been set up all over Europe. So the pre uh they were familiar with the system, if you like. So they firstly came to uh, Northern Ireland, to Ulster, to the English or Anglo-Norman part, uh, with the Lord uh, John de Courcy, and he set them up at his main centre at Carrickfergus. And he, th they're the first Irish pre uh, house was set up. Uh, because uh, John de Courcy was bringing in religious uh, whom he could trust. He brought them from Britain. Uh, they knew the system how to uh, of uh, parochial care, the, if you like, modern system of the time. And he brought them from Dryber Abbey in Scotland, which uh, was the most important abbey in Scotland. And then, very surprisingly, in the west of Ireland, in the Gaelic province of Connacht, uh, they came directly from Premontre. And the way that it works, and still does, is that a few canons were sent from the mother house, say, in this case, Premontre. So you had French canons coming to set up in Ireland, and there they recruited locally. And uh, they set up firstly at the main uh, church site in Connacht, which was Tuam, the seat of the Archbishop. And also the King of Connacht at that time, uh, probably Cahal Crave Jarrick, which means the battler with the red arm. Okay. With the red arm. <laughs> well, branch, mm. yeah. Uh, so, um, they set up there, probably brought by the king and the archbishop, who was also his brother-in-law, by the way. So between the two of them, they were bringing in reform in the um, in the Gaelic Church in Ireland. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Yeah. How do we know? I mean, this was a long time, eight hundred years ago. How, how, do, how do we know that? Well, we know it from documents, firstly, and very interestingly, uh, there's a letter. Uh, written by the Abbot General of the Premonstratensians or Norbertines, uh, Gervais, who was an Englishman, um, back in roughly about 1215, 1216. And he was writing to the Abbot of Vicoin in Flanders. And uh, he explains how this canon, Isaac, which is probably his religious name, it's not a Gaelic name, uh, came from uh, the the 
furthest outposts that we have gone and uh, he came uh, to learn the discipline and the observances of the order and he came in his uh, habit. It was a tunic of wool. Uh, it was age-worn and thin, uh, which suggests that the Tum Monastery were not uh, terribly affluent. Uh, but the uh, Tum community were having, and more of them had, had come the previous year, but the Tum community as the single house at that time out uh, on the very periphery of Europe, uh, you know, were having difficulty learning about how they should uh, conduct themselves in the correct manner. But they sent their canons back to um, Prémontré in France to learn this. And in this case, the abbot Prémontré couldn't cope with the number that were coming back there in the 12th early 1200s. So they were sending this uh, canon from Tume on to Vicoin in Flanders and would the abbot there please look after him and give him proper clothes and teach him. So it's a very human letter also. And then you had more canons from another abbey called Anna Down in the west of Ireland going to uh, St. Martin's at Long, which is very, uh, which is very close to Bremontre and a major medieval uh, premonstratensi and abbey, one of the most important ones. And, but um, the second abbey that was uh, founded from Bremontre was out on an island in a lake uh, called Loch Key in North Roscommon. Um, Prime real estate, it sounds like. <laughs> yes, but uh, you can imagine the, sh the cultural shock of uh, these canons from a sophisticated, you know, kind of feudal background in Europe coming to an island in the west of Ireland on a lake. And they tried to um, conduct their, uh, the running of their uh, monasteries in the French manner. The canon from Tume who went to Bremont three was there to learn the French language, uh, which is, uh, so they, they would have been able to negotiate from uh, these two uh, Premonstratensian abbeys with the Anglo-Norman lords, because they spoke French also. And uh, in fact, the founder of Loch Key, his name was Clarus McMoylan, he was the archdeacon of the local diocese, El Finn. He was a great arbitrator between the Gaelic and the Anglo-Norman. And I guess that it was because he could speak both French and, uh, well, perhaps, and Irish or Gaelic, if you like. So he could negotiate with both sides. Well, uh, that cooperation uh, began to fall apart, uh, fall apart in the 16th, 17th century, is that correct? With uh, Cromwell and, and uh, they yes. tried to eradicate the Catholics, if I'm not mistaken, or at least convert them. Uh, yes, of course, once the Protestant Reformation uh, began, you know, that was to be the end of Catholicism. And you're talking Henry VIII, he, in Ireland it started basically in the 1540s, and part of that was to dissolve the monasteries. But really to a large extent, the ordinary person living in Ireland, the religion didn't change at all for, for a long time. Uh, so they're, they're, and they just continued to go to, you know, church, the same churches. Um, you couldn't really just change it all overnight, as you can imagine. Um, so, and especially in the west of Ireland, where um, the king didn't really have control. So it happened much quicker in the eastern half of the country. So if you like, the Gaelic monasteries out in the west of Ireland, they kept going till about 1600. And once Elizabeth I then, once her policies began to bite deeper and she, her authority was uh, spread pretty much over the, the whole country, and then afterwards with the succeeding English kings. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. We could talk about this for a good long time. But thank you for being with us uh, thank you. today. I hope you've enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.